So. We're still kind of at a point in the course where we're trying to understand how computers work. Um, and I know it's kind of surprising that you know in the lab you're already expected to be using them to do stuff. So uh, we're getting we're getting sort of furiously through all of this all of this computer theory stuff, um, and we're going to cover most of the rest of of uh, really sort of basics stuff today um, in the next few lectures, although uh, I still have one on uh, computer processors that I want to do a little bit more in depth into processors. Um, and I'm considering either doing that next week uh, when we meet or maybe uploading an additional video lecture in the meantime. But um, yeah, so this is going to be very useful for Lab 1 stuff, and there's also, uh, with Lab 1, there's an assignment where you'll do some binary math and stuff like that. So this will be helpful for that. Um, and, yeah, so we're, we're getting there. I, I am going to talk about C and C structures and all that stuff, yes. but, but uh, today I'm mostly going to be covering some background theory. I'll talk about some stuff at a really high level today, as far as C goes and what you guys are going to be um, doing in the lab. Uh, and then next week, I'll get more into some cool aspects of C. Uh, but I encourage you, uh, the Kernahan and Ritchie book or some other Intro to C book, to be reading that this week because you need to be writing stuff in C next week. And I've updated the notes to include uh, um, uh, I have uh, sort of like new and improved instructions on installing that development environment on your laptops. It's now in uh, Appendix, I think it's C, um, Appendix C. And uh, I also have given you a little, there's, I think there's like a uh, playing with C, I think is a, is a section that I added there. It's a resource. I think Appendix C is the resource appendix. So it's a resource that uh, I wrote that essentially like gives you the starting point for just like a really uh, easy C environment. So it's not identical to our development environment and the compiler is not exactly the same, but um, you can use GCC and just on any desktop or laptop computer, you can write little bits of C code and just to play with it, sort of like a sandbox. Um, the, you can install the whole development environment, but it is, you know, a lot more space and more work to get it going on your own machine. But if you just wanted to say, like, when I'm writing in any language I'm kind of new to, I have to just, even when I'm writing one that I'm familiar with, I'll often just, like, play around in... Um, some sort of dummy script on the side and just see like would this compile, would this run, that type of thing. So there's a compiler called GCC, the GNU C compiler and it's it's good and actually the, the GNU C compiler is what the uh, NI compiler, C compiler um, is built from. Like the, so the one that the NI um, the NIC development tools installs and uses. It's built from the GCC compiler, so it's very similar. So there's gonna be some slight differences, but if you write stuff uh, and compile it in GCC, you're probably gonna be okay. Um, just to just to test it out, just to see if it works. It's a good place to play. So those are some some things that will hopefully help you as you're approaching the labs. Um, and yeah. So I'm, I might show you guys some of those things today. Uh, I also got rid of the old, uh, like, yes. my old notes from there because I think that was just confusing people. So I just wiped that all out. Um, hopefully to be replaced by nice, pretty, clear file. notes. And the single file is just all there is right now because my script is wonky with the symbols that show up and the headers. So it's freaking out. So I. 
I haven't fixed my script that crawls through the PDF and splits it up. Because I only have so much time. So. <laughs> okay. Numeral systems. Lecture 1, 4. The following is a myth in the good sense of the term. Um, I know myth sometimes m means like not true nowadays, but like it's not what I mean by myth in this context. Um, it means there's a truth that's embedded in a sort of story form. Okay. Niles was an unusual boy with great hair, living in a time before number systems. Quantities were familiar, but symbolic representations of them were not. Niles lived in a grove of trees. The grove on the other side of the hill was home to his friend Daphne, a sassy, no-nonsense girl. Who's there? <laughs> Niles, uh, uh, so my dog, you guys might know my puppy is named Niles. His cousin is named Daphne. So, and also Niles and Daphne are the, uh, the cute couple from Frasier. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yes. That is an amazing show, though. So. Um, so one day, Niles and Daphne were walking together and, as children do, began arguing about whose grove had more trees. If the argument had been about who had more skipping stones, they could have simply matched up stone for stone to discover who had more. But this was impractical with trees. Niles had an insight. We can represent each tree by a drawing and match these to determine who has more. It went something like this. They drew a tree for each of Niles' trees and a tree for each of Daphne's trees. They discovered, of course, that Daphne had more trees in her grove. Not to be discouraged, Niles proposed they compare instead the number of trees on each's entire side of the hill. However, there were many more trees. Uh, there were many more trees. So Daphne suggested they simply draw the symbol T, let's call it T, to represent each tree to save time. The results were no more satisfying because Niles still had fewer than Daphne. Oh no, one of my symbols didn't come through, that sucks. Um, Niles pushed on. Let's include the neighboring hill on each side. With so many more trees, Niles suggested a shorthand notation. And I'm really sad that this symbol didn't come in, but we'll just use this symbol. It was, it's, an, uh, it's a circle in the notes. I don't know why it's coming out, it didn't come through, but for whatever reason it didn't come through, so we'll just um, pretend like it's this X box thing. <laughs> uh, okay, so we can compactly represent the number of trees with two symbols, with the X box and the line, used in combination. She explained it to Niles by counting up. I think I switched who suggested it there in midstream. Uh, so a blank would correspond to the X box or the, the zero. Um, the uh, uh, one tree would correspond to a line. Two trees would correspond to a line and a zero. Uh, three trees, two lines, and so on. So that you see that the position of, the relative position of the symbols is uh, what's important in this depiction. Although, really, this would be a lot prettier with the O's. Um, yeah. Okay, and so and so on and so forth. And you see that you can you can get away with drawing fewer symbols if you include this positional notation. Like, the, for instance, the last one is seven trees and only three symbols required. That is, each position could take on two symbols, but the position of each symbol denoted its weight. The far right symbol represented either a lack, O, 
or presence bar of a single tree. The next symbol to the left was the overflow from the first symbol, and therefore represented the number of pairs of trees. The next symbol to the left was the next overflow, representing pairs of pairs of trees. Okay? So that's kind of like this concept uh, 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 of pairs of pairs of trees uh, of things. What fun! They started counting, and Daphne immediately recognized a process improvement. If we use more symbols, we can represent numbers even more compactly. Daphne suggested a symbol for each digit of their hands. Okay, um, So 10 symbols in all, characters going, and they're familiar to us, as 0 through 9. Um, now they could count on their fingers. Boom, 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 all the way up. Notice that even fewer symbols could be used to represent more things. That is, the second symbol now represented a group of 10 of the group to the right. The leftmost uh, what I actually meant in all of these was the rightmost. <laughs> Uh, so, my apologies. Right, right. This is why you should um, prove it. <coughs> okay, so the rightmost is the number of trees. The next right, uh, or, or the next to the left, <laughs> that's what got, that's what's confusing here. Next to the left, the number of tens of trees. The next, the number of tens of tens, or hundreds, the next, the number of tens of hundreds, which is thousands, etc. Daphne still had more trees, unfortunately. Just couldn't win, Niles. He just lost every single time. But they did develop, you know, the two most important number systems that we have. So <laughs> they had that going. I mean, so there's that. So good job. Um, okay, so now let's uh, talk about this in, in general. So Niles and Daphne, when they represented a tree by this T symbol, created a very simple numeral system, a way of representing quantities with symbols called numerals. Once they recognized the value of including multiple symbols, the circle and the bar at first, and endowed the position of each numeral with significance, the system became a positional numeral system. The number of numerals used is called the system's base. Two for the system with the circle and the line, and ten for that with 0 through 9. Base 2 systems are called binary and typically use the symbols 0 and 1 instead of circle and line, which were suggestive of 0 and 1. <laughs> um, uh, base 10 systems are those with 10 numerals, the most common of which is called the Hindu Arabic numeral system and uses the Arabic numerals 0 through 9. And there's a really interesting history. I recommend reading the Wikipedia article on that. It's really kind of cool. Um, so let's consider the meaning of the Arabic number 937. It means nine hundreds, three tens, and seven ones. A corresponding arithmetic representation is 9 times 10 to the 2 plus 3 times 10 to the 1 plus 7 times 10 to the 0. Similarly, the binary number 1011 has the meaning one pair of pairs of 1s, zero pair of pairs of 1s, one pair of 1s, and 1. Are these filled in for you guys? 
They're not. Oh, okay. <laughs> I put in the wrong one. Dang it. Okay, I'm about to pull in the other one because I, I, I gotta, I gotta, I, I want to fill these in for you guys. I was looking down. I was like, gosh, I thought I was supposed to fill these in, but they're already in there. <laughs> that old mistake. Okay. Um, so I'll finish this page and I'll switch. Similarly, the binary number. Uh, okay, now that's right. So let's convert this binary representation to Arabic. So in the fourth, in the fourth position, there's one corresponding to this guy. Uh, one times ten, or times two to the third, because base two, two to the third, plus zero times two to the two, so the zero came from this zero, plus one times two to the one, plus one times two to the zero, which is equal to 11 in base 10. This highlights an important ambiguity. How can we tell in which numeral system 11 is written? We cannot. So we must either rely on context explicitly state it or add subscripts, as in this case. So this is the, the way we would want to write it um, to make sure there's no ambiguity. In binary, it's 1011. In base 10, it's 11. So you put the subscript of the base on there, just so that you know. As a rule, we restrict interpretations of numeral system denoting subscripts to Arabic. So any subscripts down here, we assume our Arabic, it, it's, you know, we're not, yeah, we're not using um, a binary subscript because that's just another layer. <laughs> so we just assume that. Um, now we're going to introduce nuanced versions of the above numeral systems. So at this point, I think it's a good time to switch over to the one where I actually have to fill things in. So pause for just a moment while I Get that it's queued up. That was the one I got. I need the partial one. It's hilarious how many moves you have to make correctly to actually succeed in getting one of these <laughs> lectures running. So many moves. That's looking better. Freeze these. So funny. Every time I get like a couple hours, I, I try to like write the scripts that are supposed to do all these things. Cause I've had them before and I lost one of them. I don't know where it is. And uh, yeah, it's just it's too complicated because it's like in a language I've almost never used. And yeah, one of these days. So many things. OK, uh, good. So this is where we are, decimal numeral system 143. Representing non-integer numbers is done with a radix point, often a dot like that, um, what we've called the, the decimal point, or the period. Um, the decimal numeral system is the Hindu-Arabic system extended to include non-integer numbers. Digits, which are just, it's just short for decimal numerals, uh, increasingly right of the radix point, called a decimal point in the decimal system, represents tenths, hundredths, thousandths, etc. For instance, the decimal 2.73 would be 2 times 10 to the 0, because it's in the 1's place, plus 7 times 10 to the negative 1, because it's in the 10's place, plus 3 times 10 to the minus 2 because it's in the hundredths place. Great. Right. 
So that is the decimal system. Um, and that's the one that, you know, we're rather familiar with, I think. That, that's the one. We use it quite a bit, yeah. <laughs> the hexadecimal numeral system is probably the one that looks the freakiest. So the hexadecimal numeral system extends the decimal system with an additional six numerals, borrowed from the beginning of the Latin alphabet to have a total of 16 numerals. Zero through nine, and then it gets weird, A through <laughs> F. So these are, uh, there's a reason for this, um, and that is it provides a convenient way to represent the contents of computer memory, and so we'll, we'll do that later today. <laughs> Um, but, yeah, uh, otherwise you might think, gosh, I mean, like, well, well, why stop at 16? Like, we could keep going. Um, yeah. So, it's convenient for ways that we'll discuss. Okay. Converting to and from decimal. Converting from a base B number with digits like so, starting at N and going down to M, the decimal is straightforward. Represent each numeral in base 10, then use the formula X in base 10 is equal to the sum of each of these values times the base to the ith power. And this is actually the formula that we've been using kind of intuitively already, right? We didn't, we didn't actually have the formula, but we were using the formula. So for instance, if x in base 2 is 1010.01, then x in base 10 is equal to, how are we going to do the conversion? So it's 1 times 10 to the what? Three. Three plus. Zero. Oh, wait. I tricked myself. Is it times 10 to the 3 or is it times. The base is not 10, is it? Times one. Ta two close. To two. Three. Two. Because there's two possible uh, uh, characters, right? Two to the 3. Plus. Zero, two. zero times 2 to the 2. Plus one, two, three, one. And it turns out this is 10.25. And we should probably, you know, put the little subscript 10 for base 10. Yeah. So that's, so it's pretty easy to convert from any base to base 10. And the reason is that we get to use our familiar multiplication, uh, our familiar arithmetic. So uh, uh, actually, this formula works for other bases, but we aren't as comfortable multiplying hexadecimal numbers together. At least I'm not. Maybe you guys are. I shouldn't speak for you. Uh, <laughs> so we, I So we'll talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, so we'll talk about it but not yet first let's just <laughs> let's let's start let's start let's start with just seeing if we can convert uh, a, a base 16 number to a base 10 number so if x16 is b8 dot f which is just a creepy looking number um, we would say that x10 is equal to so remember, we have to represent each of these in base 10 in the formula. So what is B in base 10? Uh -huh. So 
Yes, 11. That's right. 11 times, and then what's the base? 16 to the second. Yeah. Uh, actually, no, 16 to the 1, right? Because this is the 0 to 1. Uh, so 11, it's because, yeah, 9, 10, 11, so A, B. Yeah. So plus, and then 8 is just 8, conveniently, in base 10. Yeah, and F is 15, right? Uh, oh, 16. No, 15. 15. Uh, so times 16 to the 0 plus F is 15 times 16 to the 0. It's 15 because we counted 0 as one of them. There are only 16 characters. Uh, yep. And this comes out to be 184.9. Three seven five. Okay. So that's a fun one. Okay. Converting from decimal into a base B numeral system can be accomplished by the following procedure. For the integer part of the number, successively divide by the base B10. Uh, represented in base 10. Uh, the remainder, x in base b, um, represented in base b, of each step is the base b numeral in that position from right to left. I know that is really hard to parse, so that's why we're going to do an example. <laughs> For the decimal uh, part of the number, successively multiply by the base b10. The overflow of the, of the uh, 1 base 10 and above, at each step, is the corresponding base B numeral in that position from left to right. Which is the reason why most people don't even explain it in words. They just do examples. <laughs> but I figure it's good to try to say it in words if you can. So, um, okay. Uh, so before I do the example, one more note. Note that division and multiplication in the conversion process are the usual base 10 versions. Technically, this process can be used for converting between other numeral systems, but it is not recommended due to our unfamiliarity with division and multiplication in these numeral systems. So um, we will learn how to do them, though, in the next lecture. I mean, we'll, we'll scratch on the surface of how to do them. Um, we won't get into details because I, I feel like you can wander off into the weeds on this stuff and spend a lot of time on it, whereas we're just like, we want to understand how to do it, but there are only you know, a few moves we really need to make. A lot of like interpreting binary as hex, hex is binary, and then being able to turn that into base 10 if we needed to, that kind of thing. That's usually what we're, what we're doing. OK, so decimal to binary and hex. So convert base 10 number 14 to binary. Uh, that's the first part. And then the second part is convert it to hexadecimal. And then the last one is to convert this decimal, uh, 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 fractional decimal in base 10 to binary. Okay. And I warn you, this, this one has got a lot of, lot of steps. Um, and it's not even that it's hard. It's just like repetitive. You just have to keep going and going. It's like long division. Thank you, like writing it all down the page. I mean, it's essentially the same. So, uh, for one, converting 14 base 10 to binary. So the following table shows the division. So let's let's draw a table. Um, so in the first column, we're going to have. The base B, which is the base that we're going to, um, and so it's going to be two for us, right, in each and every case. Um, but it's also going to be the divisor in each case, too. 
Uh, and then we're going to have also the column that is the uh, dividend or also the quotient. So depending on which step you're on. Dividend quotient. And then finally over here, the remainder. And the remainder is the part that we actually are going for because the remainder is going to be our binary uh, readout. So at each step, the remainder is what we care about. What is that, the middle one? Uh, the this is the dividend or the quotient. Yeah. So what we start out with is 14, right? Start with 14. And then we're going to divide it by 2, OK? And when you divide 14 by 2, I know, you get 7. And what's the remainder? Zero. Zero. No remainder. And we're just going to keep doing this over and over again <laughs> until we get to the bottom. And our, our binary number is going to be in the right column, in the, in the remainder column. So it's actually like, as soon as you understand how to set this up, it's just like, it's pretty easy to do. But, you know, it's fun. So uh, if we divide um, 7 also by 2, we've got to keep dividing by 2, because that's our base. So we get 3 remainder If you do 7 divided by 2, you get 3 remainder what? 1. 1. Nice. Uh, and then if you divide 3 by 2, one, one. 1, remainder 1. And then if you divide 1 by 2, you get 0, zero remainder 1. It's actually kind of funny because I hadn't done, I mean, like, unless you're doing this, you hardly ever do remainders anymore. Like, once you, you did remainders when you, like, at some point, and then you, like, never did remainders again. Man, this is back in the day, remainders. And actually, I had, I had to go back and review like some pretty basic arithmetic stuff, too, because you forget how to do it by hand, because you never do it by hand when you're older. Okay. Like the long multiplication and stuff like that. Like, I didn't remember that part. I didn't remember how. I was like, OK, and then you, do you sum the columns. I don't know. How yeah. We did, we did convert 14 base 10. That's the way we did it. Yeah. yeah, so what we're so now we're not uh, so we have to say the, the 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 end of this which is so we got down to 0. So if we keep dividing by 0, 2 by 0 is going to keep getting zeros here, remainder zeros forever, okay? And so we actually uh, say therefore 14 base 10 is equal to, in binary, 1, 1, 1, 0 in base 2. So where we read from the bottom of the remainder column to the top, 1, 1, 1, 0. And if we had kept going, if we like forgot to stop here, we kept going, we just keep getting 0, 0, 0, 0 thereafter, which is just a bunch of zeros to the left here, which don't, it's just like if you added, if you had the number 7 and you kept writing zeros out here, it wouldn't, wouldn't change. Oh, wait, that would change it. Yes, that would change. <laughs> <laughs> Swear to God, I didn't plan that. OK, uh, good. So that's, that's how to convert. A decimal number to binary. Um, and there's a similar process for um, converting to hexadecimal, but I kind of gave us a softball here. Um, yeah, so 14 in base 10 to hexadecimal, well, we haven't even, we haven't overflowed the, 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 one, the one numeral. Uh, uh, of the hexadecimal, because there are 16 of them, right? Yeah. Or there, yeah, there are 16 of them. So we haven't. So in fact, 14 in base 10, uh, it's E. It's E in base 16. 15 in base 10 is, is F. 
<laughs> in both 16. Yes. Okay. So that one was easy. But we could have done exactly the same thing. We would have had to divide by 16 each time, though, right? But I gave us an easy one. And then I'm going to give us a really long one. <laughs> Part three is really long. So you convert 421.73 from base 10 to binary. Okay? This one is fun. And it, it will... I think we could do it all on... Well, <laughs> we'll see. I think we might have to use the next page, too. Okay, so uh, <laughs> you have to do two tables here. So, so the idea is the first table you do gives you the, the uh, integer part. So the 421 we'll do first, which is actually the easy part. So four, So 3. For the integer part, four hundred twenty one, um, we construct the table. Now let's very similar to before. Um, yes, so this part is the same. B or divisor is the first column. Dividend, or the quotient, is the second column, and the remainder is the third column. So this part's the same as the last thing that we did. Um, we start out with 421, converting to binary, so we divide by 2, and we get 210. Remainder 1, divide by 2 again, we get 105, remainder 0, divide by 2 again, we get 52, remainder 1, divide by 2, we get 26, remainder 0, divide by 2, we get 13, remainder 0, divide by 2, we get 6, remainder 1, divide by 2, we get 3, remainder 0. <sighs> um, divide by 2, we get 1, remainder 1. Divide by 2, we get 0, remainder 1. Wow, I even did that right in my notes. Either that or I got it wrong both times. <laughs> <laughs> Same wrong. Okay. Did you guys, are you guys following that? Yeah. Keep waiting for the 5. Waiting for the 5? Like over in the remainder? Yeah. <laughs> no fives shall come. If we were doing hex, you could get that. Uh, or even if you're doing dead to decimal. Okay, so therefore, so we just did the integer part. Therefore, uh, 421 base 10 is equal to, we go from bottom to top of the remainder, so 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, and base 2. Um, now, the decimal, <laughs> or the... Uh, the fractional part. So then, so after that, we're going to have a, the, the radix point, right? And then we're going to have this other one. But the other one requires a slightly different process. It's similar, though. It's 
also going to be long as hell. <laughs> okay. Um, but it's kind of fun. I don't know. I kind of enjoy it. So the first column in the fractional part, if you'll read the second bullet point and try to parse it, is essentially um, that b is a factor. So we're actually multiplying in, instead of dividing by the base in this one. And then the, the other factor here, um, which also, this also has a product, depending on which side of it you're on. Um, and then instead of having a remainder, we're going to have an overflow. Okay? So the... We, all, we, we always start with so the fractional part is 0 0.73. So what we're going to do, and actually I'm going to, um, I'm actually not going to put the 0. I'm just going to put 0 0.73. Um, we're going to keep multiplying by our base, which is 2, if we're converting to. Um, we keep multiplying by the base, and we're going to keep overflowing into the 1. Okay, so... 0 0.73, we multiply that by 2, we would get 1.46, right? But we don't write the 1, we push that over into the overflow. We write a 1. So if you multiply 0 0.73 by 2, we would get 1.46, right? But instead of keeping that 1 here, we're going to push it into the overflow. Every time we, we get a 1 that would pop up over there, we push it into the overflow. So instead of, instead of having the remainder, we have the overflow, which is slightly different, but it's, yeah. So this process, though, of continuing that same loop uh, gives us these overflow bits, which are the fractional portion of the binary number. It's pretty fun. So we'll multiply by 2 again. And 0.86, there's no overflow on that one. Times 2 again. Wait, 0.92. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 92. See, I thought I could just do this um, in my head on the go, but apparently I can't. Uh, this would be 0.84 with an overflow, right? By 2 again. 0.68 with an overflow. Two again. 0.36 with an overflow. Okay. So far, so good on my notes. <laughs> uh, 0.72, no overflow. Okay. Uh, times two again. So that was going to be 4.4 four with an overflow. Two again. 8.8, eight, eight, no overflow. 2 again. 7.2, with an overflow. 2 again. 4. 4, with an overflow. Is that, am I off? I'm off my notes right now. Uh, let's see. Wait, did I, did I, was that right? 8.8, eight, and then... 72, yeah. yeah, and then 44. Oh, good, I didn't have to go as far. Sweet. But notice, we, so it, it, can we verify that that's correct? Is that correct? I'm, I screwed up somewhere in my notes, obviously. Um, so, yeah, I feel pretty comfortable. Can reach, reach another number that have the same? Yeah, so notice that these are the same. We stop from there. So, so it's going to keep repeating. If we keep going, it's just going to keep repeating. This doesn't necessarily happen. We might uh, reach... 3.76, not 0.72. Uh, right here. Yes, that's it. Let's see. Uh, yep, I was right in my notes. Which makes this... So, yeah. We thought we were done early, but we weren't. <laughs> Dang. Um, point, <laughs> point 0.76, so that gives us point 0.52. Um, and had an overflow. 
Two again. Um, zero four with an overflow. Zero eight, no overflow. One six, these ones are easy. <laughs> no overflow. Three two, no overflow. Let's stop for a second and think. What would I need to get in order to stop this thing? Yes, you need 0 0.50, and then you multiply by 2, and you get yourself a nice 1.0, and it's just zeros forever, right? But, by God, we are still going 0.32 uh, uh, times 2. 0.64 with no overflow times 2. Oh, here comes another overflow. 2.8 times 2 again. It would be uh, 0 0.56 uh, with no overflow times 2 again. Uh, 0.12 with an overflow. We're getting there, guys. Don't worry. Times 2 again. <laughs> Point uh, two four no overflow two again four eight no no overflow two again I know it was so close to point five oh we were like so excited there uh, uh, times two again is nine eight no overflow times two again is nine t uh, six right nine six one. Overflow. Okay, uh, two times 0.4 should be 0.96. Yeah. No overflow. 92. So this would be 92. Good. Uh, with with an overflow. Two again would be. 0.84 with an overflow, and wait a second. What now? 84 and way up. 84. Whew. <laughs> so now we know that be between this guy and this guy, it's just going to keep coming back to itself, right? Yeah. Over and over and over again. That loop's going to happen. So, what does it mean? so you're going, so it, this is one of those repeating um, decimal numbers, or not decimal, but repeating uh, fractional numbers, like you guys saw with decimal numbers that repeat forever. Is that like, like one third, point three, 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 forever? So, um, we can stop um, at this point. So we stop when you have identical rows or when you get to zero. Couldn't we have stopped at point 0.92? Mm, yes. Point oh, wait. Point 0.92. Yeah, point 0.92 we had, didn't we? Yeah, we did have point 0.92. We could have stopped at point 0.92. Burp. It's easier for me to fix than you. But yeah, so we could stop there. One earlier. So we need to rewrite that column of numbers <laughs> as a sequence. So uh, what we have is, I'll end the table. Whoa. I'll end the table. And I'll say, uh, so 421.73 in base 10 is equal to 1101001001 point um, it's so it repeats um, So what we do is we repeat from the second digit all the way down to, we actually are going to lop it off right here, right? So we have to say uh, 
one, and then it's zero, um, zero, and it's three ones. One, 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 and then zero, one, zero. Uh, uh, you go from the bottom, uh, from the top down, yes, from the top down. Um, yes. And then, um, so zero, one, zero. And then one, one, one. And then four zeros. And then one zero one and then uh, three zeros and then it repeats so all those repeat the point one doesn't repeat but everything after that does wow in base two don't forget that subscript yeah What's that? Uh, the digit. We start the digit from where? Uh, we start. So they're repeating? Yeah. Yeah, so what we repeat is when we see this 0 0.92 show up here, we know that 0 0.92 showed up before, and that means that the next thing would be 0 0.84, and the next thing would be 0.68, and this would all repeat again. So from here down, if we drew our repeat kind of on the side instead of on the top, uh, this is all going to repeat over and over and over again down to right before it happens again. So that's the part that repeats. So yeah, which is an interesting thing. Um, so this is actually a really interesting result because we had a very uh, uh, exact decimal value which was 421.73. If we're going to represent this um, it, by a binary number, we would have to write out an infinite number of numbers to represent it, right? So you have to round, okay? Um, this introduces rounding error, even when it might appear we know the number exactly. So if, if we are going to store this as a binary number in a computer, which is our typical way of doing it, then we're going to have error introduced just from this um, fact. So. I will say that this is if you represent the number as a floating point number, which is common to do, um, and we'll talk more about what floating point numbers are in, later today. Um, so this is our um, uh, uh, conundrum with uh, representing a, a number, a decimal number that we know exactly as a binary number is there's this, this truncation that has to happen to represent it. Um, sometimes there is a finite number of, uh, a finite representation of the number in binary, and sometimes there's not. It just depends. For instance, uh, I think point one, there, it's an infinite um, it's a sequence of binary numbers, so you can't represent it exactly. Uh, however, there are alternative ways, um, and not just floating point numbers, you can do other representations um, which would allow you to encode it exactly and so we'll talk a little bit about what that would look like um, but a binary coded digit um, would allow you to do that so you could rep you could what you could do is you could say oh we'll represent a four or we'll represent a two or represent a one a seven and a three separately and we'll keep track of the fact that there's a decimal point in there and then you can represent 421.73 exactly um, if you have a binary representation of 4, 2, 1, 7, and 3. And so that's what, that's what we might do. We don't do that very frequently, but if we wanted a really precise representation, we could. So we'll talk about that a little bit more later today.
But what it will affect? It will affect uh, memory or? It will. So if you use that method of representing um, these digits separately, or, uh, then it's a little bit less compressed in memory, so you take up a little bit more space. Um, so uh, people still use it if they have like, very specific applications where they don't want to have any errors creep in from this floating point arithmetic stuff. But uh, it's, it's, not the, it's not the standard way of dealing with numbers in a computer. Usually it's floating points. It's most common. But occasionally you'll need to use something more precise, like a, a, a BCD. Well, we'll, we'll talk about that. Binary coded digit. It's pretty cool. Okay. So let's see. I had uh, just a tad. No, yeah, just a tad more. So I have a question. Yeah, what's up? So you said that we can start by two. Uh, the first one when we hit, uh, when we have identical. Ah, uh, is w if we ever have a 0 0.50 show up in here? Because when we multiply 0 0.50 by 2, we get an overflow of 1, and we get 0, 0 left over. And so then it keeps repeating 0, overflow 0, 0, overflow 0, over and over again. So if, if it happened by accident and you didn't notice it, you would just get a bunch of zeros, and then you might probably, then you'll say, oh, well, look, they're the same. And oh, it's just zero, and it's just repeating forever. So if you follow these rules, you'll find that zero repeats forever. And that's a good thing to find out. So you don't have to represent that. OK. Whew. There's so much in this class. It's fun. <laughs> We started out with a myth today. We're doing binary numbers. <laughs> yeah, it's all kinds of stuff. OK. Binary numbers, so converting between hex and binary. Binary numbers can easily uh, be converted to hexadecimal and vice versa. In lecture uh, 1, 6, which will be later today, these conversions will be motivated. Um, but for now, we're just going to unmotivatedly do it. Um, so there are 2 to the 4 equals 16 unique four numeral binary numbers. Okay, so four binary numerals together is there are two possibilities for each one, so 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 16. <laughs> um, uh, and 16 hex characters, which is no coincidence. That's why there are 16 hex characters. <laughs> so um, this allows us to write each grouping of four binary numerals called a nibble as a single hex character. So if we take four binary numerals in a group, we'll call that a nibble. Um, We'll later talk about how eight together is called a byte, and so that's why nibble. It's a part of a byte. It's just a part of a byte. Can I have a bite of that, honey? You can have a nibble. Yes. Uh, it is often easiest to convert each nibble to base, <laughs> that's just a funny word to say, <laughs> to base 10, then trivially to hex. For instance, <laughs> Uh, for instance, the binary 1101 is, if we're going to convert it, converting to decimal is easy, right? So 1 times 10 to the 3 plus, or not 10, goodness, 2 to the 3 plus uh, 1 times 2 to the 2 plus 0 times 2 to the 0 uh, Two to the one, my goodness. Too many numbers, plus one times two to the one is equal to 13 base 10. At least it was last night. So 
The thirteenth hex numeral is D. So we could represent one so I, what I didn't say is so one one zero one two equals D in sixteen. So every nibble can be represented by a single a single hex character, which is nice. And that's actually I don't want to say like most of our motivation for using hex, but it's a big part of our motivation for using hex because we really don't like to look at a whole lot of ones and zeros because it's really hard to parse it. For instance, this. <laughs> yeah. Can we write this letter? This. <coughs> yeah, we could. So we could say. Uh, so one zero zero zero. So that's going to be. Eight. Is that right? I think yeah, so. Eight, yeah. yeah. So eight would be that. And then this one is three. And then, yeah, um, et cetera. You could just write it in hex. Yeah, it's two. Uh, two. Zero, one, yeah, two. And then this one here. Uh, two to the three eight times four or plus four is twelve, yeah. Twelve, so C A B C yeah. C etc. So you could do it in fewer in fewer uh, nibbles. <laughs> do it in nibbles. Uh, yeah. Similarly one can convert a hex numeral to a nibble by converting First to decimal, then to binary. So we use decimal kind of like as our bridge between them because mostly just because we prefer doing arithmetic in base 10. Once again, that's just me. We're going to learn in the next lecture how to do arithmetic uh, in binary. We're, not, we're just going to mention how to do it in hexadecimal. We're not actually going to do it because I don't want to. Um, yeah. Also, it's not super useful to learn how to do it. You could. You could do it. Also, we have computers that do it really well. So. Um, okay. Any questions before I end this one? Let's take a little break.